Hello everyone, the time has come to talk all about the third episode of The Witcher Show on Netflix, and as usual there's going to be a lot of spoilers, so beware. Also, if you want to hear my thoughts on the other episodes, you can find the link to the playlist down in the description. Before I start, I want to say that this episode is absolutely packed with things that are either not in the books or have been changed. Which of course is not necessarily a bad thing, I just wanted to let those of you who haven't read the books know. A pregnant girl who died before her time. Okay, starting with this gloomy scene of a dying young man's story. I like that very much. It reminded me of some of the great quests and stories I adore so much about the third game, and it very much fits the atmosphere of the books as well. Except at the very end, they kind of ruined it with that stock scream. But still, there's also this Witcher here, to whom I'll go back in a moment. Next up, we have Geralt being a little rude to a prostitute, pretending like he's listening to her but not actually doing it. Shouldn't you know when someone's pretending? Anyway, she tells him of a witcher in Temeria who took 3,000 orins in advance for a job and allegedly ran away with it. Meanwhile, earlier we saw the same witcher, presumably, taking the money and get killed. And here's the thing, if memory serves me, this witcher is actually a sum of two or three separate characters in the book. In there, Geralt is told several stories of people who attempted to lift the curse, and if I remember correctly, which I may not, um, there was one guy who ran away with the money, another one who asked for the full reward up front, and then there was a witcher who died trying to lift the curse? And I think Netflix summed it all up into this guy. And I think it's somewhat clever, given how they don't have as much time as the book does. <laughs> We have a small and cute moment with Roach. Don't judge me. And then I'm having a hard time believing that Geralt doesn't know in which general direction Temeria is located. Point me to Temeria. Point me to Temeria. To Temeria. To Temeria. But I do have a theory about why they put this scene in the show. See, in the book, this chapter starts with a tavern brawl, the reason for which is partially because people antagonize Geralt over sounding like a foreigner. And since the show already had a tavern scene in episode 1, they decided to play the whole Geralt is a foreigner card by making him not know which way Temeria is. Point me to Temeria. Then we have this scene with the rebellious workers, which is also an addition, but serves a good purpose, I think, to give us an idea of what happened in Nilfgaard, for example, and to build up the world a little bit more. <laughs> Alright, guess who we have next? Our dear darling Triss. Yes, it's about our dear darling Triss. Unless I'm mistaken, she is not part of this story in the books at all. And really, she is a very small character in the books, I suppose people who haven't read them assume otherwise based on the games, but it's true. However, it seems that the show is trying to make her a little more important by including her here, for example, but so far I can't say I'm fascinated with her involvement. And should we talk about the way she looks? I know how many people dislike her casting choice, and I'm not going to argue that she looks right, because she doesn't, but let me just say that there are other characters that in my opinion are even further away from the source material, and while the actress of Yennefer is actually killing it, especially as Hunchback Yen, I'm so far not terribly impressed with Triss. I feel something out there waits for you. Something more. Okay, let's get into the actual story. They've created this whole sequence where Geralt and Triss investigate the relation between the Striga and the King, and later the lover, I suppose, who cursed them, while in the books, not only is Triss not there, as I mentioned, but the whole thing is more or less being spelled out for Geralt in the very beginning. So for book readers, these scenes may be a little redundant, because they're basically extending the story quite a bit, only to arrive at what we already knew from the start. You'd recovered your memory, found Yennefer, so naturally, I thought the two of you had... But it turned out my amnesia changed nothing. Okay, next up we move on to Yennefer, having a sexy time with Istrid, and she has apparently summoned an illusionary crowd of people to applaud her when she gives him an orgasm. 
I think that's what's going on. Um, and I think it's a way for her to boost her lacking self-esteem. Or perhaps she needs an audience to witness her achievements. Or both. It's a nice touch with the applause. <laughs> then we go into the, um, how shall I call it, transformation chamber. I'd rather they kept the whole process a little more mysterious as it originally was. Instead, it reminds me of, uh, you know, one of these shows where a fashion guru helps young brides pick up their wedding dresses or something. Then Tessaya shows up and has this monologue for which I'm not sure if it's the same thing I think it is. She suggests that sorceresses should be the only people who must not see a single wrong thing when they look into the mirror. She also says, Look, you can free the victim in the mirror forever. I think this whole part is supposed to be a retelling of Tissaia's philosophy expressed in The Poisoned Source. But that one is much more related to the responsibility of sorceresses versus the desire to have children, and it's just different, so I don't know. Except this witcher would kill the princess as she sleeps. The books describe Foltest as a very handsome man. Call her a princess. Call her a unicorn if you'd like to. Now this whole scene is quite good. And I also got somewhat excited because I thought they were going to change the story here when Foltest said this. Is it true what they say? And the mutations that grant you your abilities also erase your emotions. Must be. Because only a man devoid of all heart could accuse a brother of bedding his murdered sister while urging him to kill her. I thought it would turn out that in the show it wasn't actually him who sired the child, but then it turns out he did actually sleep with his sister and all of that. I did try to resist at first with Ada. We both did. Then we have the meeting of the sorcerers discussing which student should go where. In my video about episode 2, some people commented that Fringilla was actually trained in Nilfgaard and not Aratusa, and I think that is really the case. But in the show she has the same school as Yennefer, so that's been changed. And so they intend on sending them to their opposite nations. Yennefer to Nilfgaard and Fringilla to Edern. This whole scene too was not part of the books, but I think it's a clever way to bring Stregobor back from the first episode. And they also show Fringilla's uncle, who is also Anna Henrietta and Sienna's uncle. And he's a black man too, which I appreciate. I already talked enough about Vringilla's skin color in other videos and that it has to be addressed somehow in relation to who her relatives are supposed to be. And so I'm glad they changed the uncle as well. Not enough fragrance in Tucson to take the stench off that nepotism. Yennefer is then upset by the decision and Tissaia brings up her elven origin, which was also brought up in the meeting, and um, it's a nice touch, I admit. I mentioned before that in my opinion showing too much of Yennefer's backstory too early is a bad move, but now that they've done it anyway, I can at least appreciate the fact that they're using it somehow to explain other things and it's not done in vain. Efforts in Sintra prevent the Brotherhood from placing a mage with elven blood in Aiden's court. Back to Geralt and Triss now, and it's snowing, I think, but everything looks like it's covered with white dust instead. And it took us halfway through the episode to finally unravel the truth about Foltest and all that, so I'm curious to know what you guys think of these changes. I just feel like Triss didn't stand out as much as she should have. Part of it is probably due to the source material. I think you can't really do too much with Triss without taking liberties, similar to what CD Projekt Red did. And another part is the acting. Someone commented on my previous video that they expected to love Triss and to be disappointed by Yennefer, and instead the opposite happened. Sabrina Glevesig. Sabrina Glevesig. Offer myself to the Brotherhood. Both the games and the audiobooks pronounce it Glevesig, but they also pronounce Edern and Skellige differently, and they also say Meliteli. I've arranged for her to stay a while with the sisters of Meliteli. <laughs> we have a little argument between Yenna and Istrid. Yenna! Get your hands away from me! And I like it. We already had some backstory for their relationship, they had some good moments, but also some hidden agendas and all that. So I'm kind of invested in this quarrel. 
I would even suggest that perhaps these should not have been Yennefer and Istred, but instead two other characters without a story set up for their future, so we can have some more freedom and more interesting things to do with them. Say you concocted this slander to gain the favor of your precious rector. It's too late. You missed initiation. The enchantments are done. And all of the sorceresses have now been transformed. Except they just have fancier dresses and makeup and look exactly the same as before. And if you thought we are in the same timeline, think again, because we have little Foltest here. They chose a good actor for him. I told you he was supposed to be a pretty boy earlier. Also, I think the age difference between Yennefer and Foltest should be greater than what is shown here. I'd say perhaps another 10 years, but I could be wrong. Then we have old Foltest sounding a bit like Batman. She told me. And this may be the best part of the episode, this dialogue here with Foltest. He has some well-written lines, and they cleverly insert bits from the butchering of Blaviken as well, once again taking advantage of some of the previous changes they made to the source material, so, you know, I appreciate it, I like it. For all it brightens, love casts long shadows. What follows now is a back and forth between the confrontation with the Striga and Yennefer's transformation. And I gotta say, it's a screaming fest. From both Yen and the Striga, but mostly the Striga. First time I watched it, my wife came to me to see what the hell is going on. And also there's a fair amount of Yennefer nudity. Anyway, let's talk about the Striga first. I'm getting slight Death Stranding vibes with the umbilical cord, but the Striga itself looks alright. Someone on my Discord said she uh, looks like a sloth. I suppose I can see where they're coming from, but it wasn't my initial reaction. The fight itself was not super exhilarating, if compared to, say, the butchering of Blaviken, but that's fine. I suppose they couldn't have the monster perform two elaborate moves for some reason. Now, this scene is well done, much dirtier and grittier than the Witcher 1 trailer. Once again, the very end was a little weird for me, you know, when he goes cross-eyed, when he loses consciousness. I have no idea if it's supposed to happen this way, the whole eyes rotating inward when we pass out, but regardless, it did feel a little unnecessarily comedic to me. You say this is all life is to you, but there is a vortex of fate around all of us, Geralt growing with each and every one of our choices, drawing our destinies in closer. Whatever she's saying here, I think she's just trying to get in his pants. That's what Booktris would have done. Okay, moving on to Yennefer's transformation. Well, turns out the fashion guru is more of a satanic surgeon of sorts. This whole procedure is surprisingly disturbing. So he grabs a scalpel and through her vagina, he removes her entire reproductive system which, based on my humble knowledge, did not make much sense, and I even consulted a cherished viewer of mine who's somewhat of an expert, and she confirms that it's basically impossible the way it's shown. But anyway, he takes out the organs, he bakes them, grinds them into dust, makes ink out of the dust, and draws on her body with it. I mean, damn, this guy's rituals can rival the crones. So then Yen walks in and steals the show, along with Fringilla's partner, are you aware that I'm in the market for just such a mage? And it all ends with a rather brief scene of Ciri approaching Broccolon Forest. Ciri! Ciri! And with that, we are done. Tell me what you think of it and all of the things I talked about. Thank you very much for watching, special thanks to my supporters on Patreon and YouTube members, and until the review of the fourth episode, enjoy the holidays, stay tuned, and be good.